Welcome to The Conquering Truth. I'm Dan Horn. I'm Jonathan Sides. I'm Charles Churchill. And I'm Joshua Horn. And tonight we want to talk about something that we've mentioned on the podcast many times before, which is just the the evil of abortion that fills our country. And even as we're recording this, the Congress is moving towards abolishing the Hyde Amendment. The Hyde Amendment is the amendment that's been in the in federal law since 76. I think every budget has had it in that says that the Department of Health and Human Services can't fund any abortion through Medicare Medicaid programs in any of the states, that if they receive federal money, they can't use that for abortion. They're, the the House passed a bill that said the Helms Amendment is removed. The Helms Amendment says that, that the federal government will not fund abortions abroad through foreign aid. And so at the national level, at least, there's a, a shift towards promoting more and more abortion, not just in the United States, but across the world. This is obviously an abomination in the eyes of God. So the question to discuss tonight is, so what does the church do to stop this? So I think, I mean, the first thing that the church would need to do is to, to preach against it. Um, there are certainly churches out there that uh, say it's okay, but, you know, perhaps we can just discount them entirely. I'm not sure if that's really what we want to be talking about as churches that won't even take a stand on such a, such a basic issue. Um, but, you know, you have a lot of the evangelical church that is against abortion, uh, strongly so, um, and yet they keep electing politicians who, who aren't doing anything about it when it comes down to it. And even going b- back to, you know, preach against it, I've been in a church before where I, you know, in Sanctity of Life Sunday, the, the, for, or the Sunday around the 20th of, of January, you know, I talked to the pastor about preaching on it, and he, we were on the board together of a, of a pregnancy support center, and he said, oh, I couldn't preach on it because you know how many women have had abortions. It's just too touchy of a subject. And this was a conservative church, and the pastor wasn't willing to speak about the issue. I mean, I've grown up in churches that were on the more conservative side, but I knew, I mean, that would preach about it. But I knew places that were kind of bordering it that wouldn't talk about it. And what they meant by too touchy was it would hurt, it would bring up, emo- it would bring up feelings, it would, bring, it would cause pain. It would cause pain to people in the church. Not that they weren't, not that even some of these people in the church weren't against it now. It's that to address it would cause injury to bring up the memory of such a thing. Right. And I think that is the argument that he was making is that we shouldn't talk about it because women in the audience would start crying. Right. Not because they even said that it was a good thing that they aborted their child, but But it would be such an emotional guilt. Yeah. A guilt that would come upon them. Right. And so it sounds like it's easy to say, well, we should preach about it. But the reality is it is so widespread in our country and in our culture. It's a difficult thing to preach about. And it's difficult because it's a sin that you just look at the statistics. There's no way that this is not a sin that has happened and is happening in the church. And, I mean, and not just people who... This isn't just something where you say, oh, this is something people did before they were saved, and now they've been saved and repented of that. This is what you're saying is that this is a sin that's festering within the church, and the church isn't addressing it, and that's why there's this latent guilt. And Right. I think there's a lot of churches that are simply not bold enough to say that, you know, no murder will inherit the kingdom of God. And it's an important idea that you have to repent. You know, such were some of you. You can repent of it. It's a sin that's it's not the unforgivable sin, but I think there's a lot of pastors who don't want to create that discomfort instead of saying to a woman that has aborted a child or is it even considering aborting the child of actually saying, you need to deal with it. This is sin. You need repentance. This is a serious sin. And even as you're talking about how that some churches weren't willing to speak about it, I was, you know, uh, hearing about how the uh, Southern Baptist Convention, back when Roe vs. Wade was decided, put out a uh, one of their resolutions saying that you know abortion's wrong, but there are cases where it's it's the right thing to do, you know, rape and incest, um, the the life of the mother, these type of things, um, and you know that has changed a lot in recent times. Um, that that though I think those ex- viewing that there are these big exceptions to the command you shall not murder applying to unborn children. I think a lot less people now are in the in the pro-life side are, are seeing those as uh, as valid. 
I mean, I think you, there's, there's been a growing rift within the pro-life movement, you know, with things like babies are murdered here versus th- there are people who look at pro-life support as just how do we help women who are in this situation? How do we comfort them? They've even, there's, a, there's argument over removing the gospel from it. And there's argument over, you know, even like you're talking about making a woman who's seeking an abortion, don't make her feel guilty for what she's specifically doing. And so all these things are kind of, they're kind of connected together. And what they really do is they remove away from the reason why God says that abortion is wrong. The reason why the Bible says abortion is wrong is that man's made in the image of God. And so, I mean, there's this part of it where when from the very beginning you you strip out God's view on the issue, you know, it's like I mean, we've talked before about murder, and there's a part of it where, I mean, I don't like murder because when I see someone get killed, I see myself being murdered, and I'm like, I don't want murder to be allowed because I don't want to get murdered. But that's not why God cares about murder. And right. if, that's your, if that's the basis of your position against murder, it's not framed correctly from the beginning, and you're really you're undercutting the, the yeah. core of it. Yeah, and these, these, this uh, disagreement that you're talking about, I mean, the terms that people are applying to this is abolishing abortion, or the, the abolitionist movement versus the pro-life movement. Right. Um, and where there's people even explicitly pushing this divide to say, w- are you for uh, completely abolishing abortion? Are you for a lot of the things that uh, the leaders of the pro-life movement say that they're for? which ends up being uh, regulate abortion and don't abolish it. And so, you know, if you're not familiar with those terms, those would be, you know, right. Google, Google abolish abortion. There's a lot of resources out there online to kind of explain what, to, to push this antithesis to say what is, what is the right tactic for getting rid of abortion? What does the Bible say about it? And some of it is what we're going to be talking about here, and there's a lot more that we will not be touching on for, for the sake of time. But one of the things that's really important to understand is if you say, you know, abortion is wrong and you should stop it, except in the case of rape and incest, what you're saying is the baby is not alive. Because if it's murder, you don't murder somebody because their father was a rapist. You just right. don't. Right. It's really obvious. There's not really any question about it. So if you go and say, well, you were produced by incest, so therefore you should die— The reality is the people in saying that there is an exception for rape and incest, what they're essentially saying is it's not really murder because nobody would actually, if they thought it was murder, nobody would make that exception. It just doesn't make any sense. You're allowed to kill the person because their father was a rapist? Right. There's nothing you could tell me about Jonathan's parents that would make it okay for me to kill Jonathan, right? I mean, that that should be, I mean, right? I mean, that's, if it's really murder... I mean, if we need more evidence than that, we can look at uh, verses where the scripture explicitly says this, like Deuteronomy 24, verse 16. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. And what we're saying with the, the rape and incest kind of exceptions is that you've got a scenario where the one person that you can guarantee is innocent of any crimes here is the one who has to pay for the sins of a father and or mother in this. And that's just, it's illogical, but it's its an emotional argument that we're willing to make because we really haven't thought through the consequences of it and we're not trying to be consistent. It's, it's preferring our own feelings and our own, uh, not wanting to tell someone difficult truths over what God's law says, which is the same reason that you have all abortion to begin with. I mean, you know, does anyone want proactively to have more abortions? Not many people, but to say this person in this difficult situation can't do what they want to do, that gets a lot harder. And the, and the, and the rape, and, and the rape uh, exception is coming from the same motivation, which though it might seem compassionate, you can't be compassionate where God says it's not compassionate. And I mean, it's important also just to, to recognize what you're also doing. When you say that it's, it's okay to murder the baby in the case of rape and incest, what you're also doing is credence to, giving credence to the other argument, right. that the woman has the right over her own body. We have laws against prostitution. Right. We have laws against suicide. against suicide. We have laws against polygamy. We have all kinds of laws that restrict what you're allowed to do with your own body. And so then they turn around, and when you say, well, it's her body. So, of course, if she was raped, then it makes sense that she can kill her child. 
Well, no, we don't do that in a whole bunch of other areas. Why would we turn around and give credence to a really bad argument? But as soon as we make that exception, because we're trying to be compassionate to somebody who suffered harm, but all of a sudden we're giving credence to an argument that is flawed from its very beginning. We don't have that view anyplace else. So why all of a sudden jump up and say, a woman has the right to choose. She doesn't have the right to stick illegal drugs in her arm, but she has the right to choose to murder her baby. Right. I mean, I don't, the, the, but all of a sudden we've made that argument sound logical. Right. And let's be clear here. Republicans, most Republicans that are running for office support the exception for right. rape and incest. So and this isn't a narrowly held view. And I do see, like you're talking about, Joshua, there is a movement away from that. But it is still widely held in the Republican Party. And if you hold to a position that doesn't allow for those exceptions, you are labeled an abortion extremist, which, okay, fine. You know, we're the real abortion <laughs> extremists are the ones that say any abortion ever is okay. I mean, that's the extremist, the yeah. ones that are saying you should be, that it's fine to kill people. That's the extremist position. We've just adopted it as mainstream. mainstream. Yeah. And like you said, it starts touching all other sorts of arguments. I mean, it starts if this is if there is an inconvenience and I mean of such magnitude that you can do this for, at what point does that stop? I mean, if someone puts a baby outside of your door and I mean, do you have an obligation to bring the baby inside? If someone, you know, someone is wounded and someone is hurt and they come to you and ask for help, do you have any, you know, nope, you don't have, you know what I mean? And you start moving all of these things. They all start shifting. Right, because in the fundamental reason they shift is because you've rejected the idea that man is made in God's image. And that's the issue that is being rejected by the church when it allows for the exception, when it's not willing to push. No, it's murder because they're made in God's image. That's why they have value. We want to assign value to people for other reasons other than the reason that God assigns value. And another thing that uh, the pro-life movement uh, has really been pushing for for a long time is that uh, that the punishment, um, that there should be no punishment for the mother. And that's another thing that really undermines your argument that this is murder of people that needs to be punished like other murder of people. Um, because you're saying that even though the mother was the one that chose to do this and paid someone to kill someone, that she should not be punished. And, and even in the Roe versus Wade decision, in the decision they said, you don't really think this is murder. You don't really think this is murder. You're not treating it equally like murder. And, you know, that's difficult for some people to accept because these people are in a difficult situation. But having a difficult situation doesn't allow you a pass to commit, you know, crimes against God's and, law. And the vast majority of people that are in that difficult situation chose to put themselves in it. I mean, yes, we talk about rape and incest. That's probably less than 2% of all abortions are kind of the statistics that I've seen. 98% of the people chose to get in the situation that they're in. And then they go, we're in such a difficult situation, we have to be able to murder our child. No, they chose it. And it is murder, and they are committing murder, and they are murderers. And the fact that we just all assume this, this bond between the mother and child so that we say her killing her baby is punishment enough. It's not. It's murder. You know, if we go to Exodus 21, 22 through 25, it says, If men fight and hurt a woman with child, so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished, according as the woman's husband imposes on him. And he shall pay as the judge is determined, but if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. You know, when that baby is born, if it dies because of the acts of the woman, even though this is talking about a man fighting, it's not saying that the woman, I mean, this is case law. This is giving an example, and it says if you cause that baby to be born prematurely so that it dies, then your life is, is to be lost. And it goes back to what, what God told Noah when he got off the ark. And it's because they're made in the image of God. And if a mother causes the death of her child deliberately, it's still murder. And, you know, one of the big arguments that people say is abortion is not health care or abortion is health care, depending on which side you're on. Um, but the reality is even the pro-life movement is making abortion health care because it is, you know, every, every anti-abortion law in the books only punishes the doctor, which means it's a pr health care procedure that's being done wrongly, not 
a crime that you can commit and you're still liable and guilty if you were paying someone to commit it. So all the pro-life bills and even I don't know if there have, you know, for, for decades, I mean, I don't know if there ever have been clear laws saying that killing unborn children is, is a crime that for a mother to commit. Right. We've put it. It's on the I mean, it's kind of funny. They treat abortion the same way you treat birth with a midwife where the midwife the midwife isn't allowed to, pr- to deliver a baby at home and if something happens the midwife ends up getting prosecuted and like i mean it's so many in the end they're really tr- like you're saying they're treating it as health care where the provider yeah where the provider did something that they shouldn't do that they weren't licensed to do or they weren't allowed to do under the terms of medical treatment and some of them are even more clear like saying uh you have to have admitting privileges at a hospital the doctor has to have admitting privileges at a hospital to perform an abortion. You have to be within so many miles of a hospital. I mean, that's super clear. You're saying this is a medical procedure, and we all we want to do is make sure it's done safely. Right. And to, I mean, to be fair to the people that are pushing that, because even though it's never going to eliminate abortion, a lot of them pushing it are they're just trying to see what they can get by the Supreme Court. And they're saying if they shift it to health care, then they can do it under health care regulations, which aren't constrained by Roe versus Wade and other decisions that followed. Right. And so part of it is they're trying to manipulate the system. Right. But also in manipulating the system, they're undermining their own argument and they're making it health care. Right. And, I mean, and that's kind of one of the big questions is what, how far does pragmatism play into it and how far does compromise play into it? I mean, what's the place for pragmatism? What's the place for compromise? If you go to Genesis 9, 5 through 6, it says, Surely for your life blood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And this is what it comes down to. When you do those other pragmatism things, you end up eliminating God out of the picture. And the way to stop abortion is to bring God into the picture and not to eliminate him. And so all these pragmatic things that are just, let's, let's go around the edges and try to reduce the number of abortions. In the end, they're rejecting God and their idolatry. Because what we've done is we've exalted man at the expense of God. And even for murder, you're not allowed to, to exalt man at the expense of God. And that probably needs some unpacking. What do you mean by these pragmatic things, the things going around the edges? I mean, there's something like we were just talking about, like health care, where you just try to, to cut it cut out in the case of, of, you know, if a doctor doesn't have admitting privileges, which makes it harder for them to practice, or these things where you go, we're going to show the picture of a baby, you know, in the womb so that the mother has to see that. She has to have a sonogram before she can abort the baby. These things that are still making her the ultimate authority instead of saying, God said it's murder. God said they're made in God's image. That's why you don't kill them. And so it ends up being pragmatic in these techniques that we use to manipulate people to try to reduce the number of abortions. That will never end. And I'm not saying it's horrific to reduce the number of abortions. I'm not saying that at all. But that's not the way you get to a point where abortions ended. And I mean, compromise can be good, but you can't compromise where you fundamentally give up the principles that you're grounded on. I mean, if you have a question, should we spend you know, a million dollars doing this or 10 million? I mean, that you can have compromise there. But when you have, do our, are our laws based on the assumption that man has made the image of God in the womb and you cannot kill it, kill men, um, in the, even in the womb, or is our law based on the assumption that we can do whatever we want, there is no God, we are sovereign over ourselves? When when you when your laws when that when that's the issue at stake you can't you can't compromise. I mean, it seems to me like some of these these things around the edges are of a different order than say the rape and incest exceptions. I mean, we look at that as being something that just clearly undermines right. the pro life movement or the anti abortion movement just because you're saying ah you know what we actually don't believe in it because there's some exceptions. But on the other hand, if you're if you're saying like take the the, the four sonogram. As, as a tactic, it's different. I mean, you could say you're not you're not saying that there's any exceptions. Maybe what you're doing is saying, ah, for the moment, I'm not going to win the whole battle. But if I can win this small battle, and then fight another day, you know, we're we're not saying that that's going to be the end. You're saying that the woman actually has more control over her body than we allow in other places in law, and that she should be the ultimate determiner. 
and that's where I see as the risk. And so, you know, and so I even see in ways that's almost a bigger risk than saying they have to have admitting privileges. But all of them, there's this balance because everybody that's on the, the pro-life side wants to reduce the number of abortions. The question is, how far can you go where you haven't undermined your argument to the point where you'll never actually, that you're actually building up a case against it? For instance, partial birth abortion, when that was passed under George W. Bush, that was the first time that there was legalization of abortion. They basically outlawed one small part of the abortion spectrum and they legalized the rest. So under the Republican president is where you end up legalizing abortion because the Supreme Court doesn't have the authority to, to pass laws. And, but the legislature does, and we did. As a nation, we made abortion legal. So if Roe versus Wade was overturned now, abortion would still be legal because there'd have to be a law that passes the House and Senate because of what George W. Bush signed. And so this was these compromises we just have to be really careful because they cause really big problems downstream. And, you, and you're also encoding, I mean, depending on the law, I mean, it, gets, it comes down to specifics. But for many of these, you're, in, you're making your law in a way less in alignment with God's law. Because if you don't have any laws against abortion, that's one thing. But now you're saying, well, abortion is fine, but you can't do it in this case or you can't do it with this procedure. So you're, you're adding more partiality, you're adding almost more injustice in a way, and you're making your law further from God's law. And the other thing too is uh, these, it's so much time and energy is wasted by the pro-life movement pushing for these things that do nothing. Take for example, the two big bills that, they're trying to, that the, the Republicans are pushing in North Carolina this year. So one is a bill, uh, it's like the Born Alive Act. Mm -hmm. where the baby survives the abortion and the doctor can't kill them. Well, guess what? That's already murder. That's murder. Past making it, even suggesting that it's not murder, it's undermining your own thing and saying maybe it's not murder now. I mean, that's, that's completely counterproductive. You're saying, you're, you're questioning the fact that, that they're not already protected under the laws that protect every other living human. This right. born. Right. So, I mean, that, I mean, that is, I mean, that's really bad. And the other one is that you have to ask someone before they abort their baby, whether they're doing it because of the race and gender or Down syndrome diagnosis of the baby. Complete waste of time. Because the, the doctor, the abortion doctor will tell them, if you say yes to this, you can't have the abortion that you want to have. It, this is what, this is what so much effort's being push towards and this is your people are pushing saying let's get rid of abortion but they're saying no we're doing the best we can passing these laws that are doing nothing well they're they're practically doing nothing on the other hand when you have a democratic governor like we do who is willing to come out and veto that you find out just how absolutely bloodthirsty we are right you know so so there is a a side yes. effect so an increasing of testimony of evil right, the, right. For nature, nation in our state right Right. But he could just as well veto it saying this is trying to <laughs> outlaw something that's already illegal, which which has been said before, too. Um, so which, it's, which is, you know, for the record, that's not what he said when he vetoed it. He's you know, right. he's, he's saying that the standard lines about infringing upon access to health care. Yeah. Well, and he said that the, the uh, I was just reading this this afternoon. He was saying that uh, you, the, the, the government should be getting between the woman and her doctor in the in the uh, in right. the hospital room whatever it's called um but you know even you know as in recent years there's been more people pushing stronger for um complete abolition of abortion i think you even see that a lot of the laws that they're pushing kind of have to respond to that and be stronger where they're not including these exceptions that they've included for years where they're saying like the heartbeat bills and things like this that even have problems but they're getting better and if people are saying this is great let's just push for these little things while we can and not saying here's the, here's the standard here's what god says this is what we need to be going for um and you know we can debate among ourselves how far we can push other things we might get past but when you don't have any standard out there saying this is what's truth this is what we need to push for you're never going to get there i think one of the reasons why this really matters is you can look at a lot of other issues that people talk about in politics that are morality based where you don't see it going back to being driven by the church and abortion abortion rights really has been driven by the church and what it goes back to what you said earlier was we've 
so the church has been tempted to remove God from having a position in the argument. And that's, that's really fundamental to what, why this really matters, is because if the church isn't representing God— <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is you know, I mean, th- then who is? I mean, <laughs> and it's it's kind of like the church is the pillar and ground of the truth, right? I mean, it's the one that should be putting the parameters of where the debate is, and instead, it's going to the world for the debate. That's that's one of my primary concerns. That I don't think as long as the church is going to the ground of the world, if it's answering a fool according to his folly, which is what the church is doing when it's doing so many of these things, it shouldn't expect to win. That's not how you actually win the argument. You don't win the argument by accepting the other side's premises. And it's, it's central to the gospel because Jesus Christ came to destroy the work of the devil. And so there's this part of it where we've removed that from the gospel. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. we've, we've untethered the idea that— because everybody recognizes you know, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. But Jesus also said he came to destroy the works of the devil— he came to destroy sin. And so there's this part of it where the gospel is about the destruction of sin. And so there's this, and so it's, that's being separated in the church. That's being removed. And so even the fact that our arguments aren't centered on how do we as the church promote what, what our Lord, what the church's husband, what our father, you know, I mean, what he cares about, you, you've lost. I mean, you and, and so the reason why abortion is really important is because there are things where we're pushing and we're saying everything should be about the glory of God. But this one is one of those things that it's always been centered in the church. It's always been fundamental to the church. And if we lose our way there, how do you really spread this out and go, how do you go broad when you can't even stick with the one that you started with? You know what I mean? We, so, I mean, it's and, really And key. it's so basic that we wonder why the church has so little influence in society. And it's because we won't stand on the truths that matter. And these are basic truths that right. matter. And how can you talk about drug use and how can you talk about dealing with poverty and how can you talk about all these other things that the church should be speaking to the world about when you don't say that man is made in God's image and that's why he has value because it undermines every other argument not every other one but a lot of other arguments and a lot of other ways that the church should be speaking to the society it undermines when you say man is not made in God's image that the woman should have the right to say do I think it's okay to kill my baby or not and in all those laws, it ends up being that the woman, she can't get an abortion until, which means that you're legalizing abortion in those laws. One of the things this relates to is we have we have a, top, a podcast we did, episode on confusion. And in there, one of the things we talk about is confusion comes, it comes granularly. And this is one of the issues where, I mean, the fa- I mean, you just think about it. The fact that you can talk about whether it's okay to kill a baby that's confusion. And the church, I mean, there's this part where we need to understand it. The fact that the fact that this is even a discussion, I mean, there's this point where somebody goes, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. How can we even, and, and so we look and we go, how can they think that a man, a boy's not a boy? You, this is how we got there, is <laughs> because we, we, we let this be a debate. You actually let this be something you go, well, I don't want to tell somebody else. I would and really Let it really be a debate in a church because... You know, like I said, you know, this pastor wasn't willing to say something in his church. Right. Even though it was a very conservative church, the verse-by-verse exposition preaching, you know, but yet he wasn't willing to say something. So when the church won't stand its ground, we should just expect the battle to be lost. We should expect the judgment that is upon us as a nation, the judgment of right. confusion. I mean, I think the closest historical comparison to abortion would be something like the Holocaust, which, I mean, that's far smaller in terms of numbers. But, you know, you look at the whatever if there were people standing against the Holocaust saying, well, we need to make sure we have bills that ask the guards. Are you taking them here because they have Down syndrome? I mean, the history will not judge those people kindly if there were had been people pushing for that. I mean, you don't get you don't get credit for saying let's limit the federal funding of concentration camps. You don't get you don't get credit for saying let's, you know, reduce it by a small percentage or saying they have to be closed to a hospital. You I mean you only get credit if you're saying this is evil. We need to stop this now.
we shouldn't expect all the politicians to take that view. The shocking thing is the church isn't taking that view, and the church isn't pushing it, and the church isn't shining forth light. And so that's one of my concerns about the compromise is that the churches tend to join in those compromises, and that's where it loses the battle. And so it's one thing for politicians to say to build a big enough coalition, I'm going to do this because it moves, but nobody's pushing them from the side of the truth that I see, or very little. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you have – in most areas, you're not going to get elected as a Republican unless you say you're pro-life. Um, and, and I think there are, are positive movements where s- more people are pushing to say you can't just say you're pro-life because we've been electing pro-life people for many years and we still have abortion. And, uh, you know, I've heard that, you know, people have even lost because the voters were saying you're, you're saying you're pro-life, but this other guy is saying he's going to abolish abortion. We're going to vote for him. And so I think there is some positive movement. You know, even uh, the Southern Baptist Convention a few weeks ago or uh, months ago, whatever it was, they passed a resolution overriding the committee that's supposed to do the resolution saying, you know, we're not just going to say prohibit federal funding. We're going to say abortion needs to be abolished. And I mean, that, I mean, that's not something that happens all the time where they're overriding the leadership of their own convention to say, no, this is important enough. And so I think there is this movement that is building that's, encouraging in a lot of ways where, where people are saying we need to hold the politicians accountable and say what do you really mean when you're saying these things there was i saw a a, a reddit post the other day and it was exp- you know it was kind of an either i can't remember if it was an ask reddit or explain like i'm five but the question was how did germany get over being nazis it was like how did they like how did they move away from it and it was interesting kind of looking at some of the discussions and they were talking about the fact that effectively they they demonized they said you know we they they would not tolerate it they declared and they declared vehemently and that they you know they they made very specific proclamations and they all agreed and they just would not allow the idea to exist and there's this part of it where that's what effectively needs to happen with abortion is the idea of killing your child as a way to deal with these problems needs to be removed completely. And I mean one of the one of the one of the accusations that comes against the pro-life movement is that all they care about is stopping someone from dying, but they actually don't care about suffering. And there is this part of it where but there is this issue that the issue is, is you have to remove this as an option before you can you know what I mean there are so many problems that you really can't deal with because everybody knows you can still take this you know i mean you can still take this exit you can't actually deal with some of these problems until you remove the option of actually murdering the child as the problem and so in one some ways i think it can be a fair criticism at times but there's another way in which it's completely unfair because you have to eliminate this as a way to deal with the problem of someone being you know the problem of someone being pregnant yeah i mean and you, you know it's, I think the, the accusation is pretty ridiculous when well, you are not going to care for the baby. I mean, you go to you, you walk right. in the abortion clinic, you go to the protesters and you say, will you take the baby? They will probably, I mean, they'll I will say just we'll say, figure out a yeah, way to do it. Right, right. They absolutely will. So, I mean, it's will. a complete I, I, lie. And the other thing is, you know, we shouldn't be ashamed to say, yeah, we're more upset that people are murdered than that people suffer. Right. Both are bad. It's worse that murder is legal. I do think that, you know, one of the things that, I've seen at abortion clinics and being on a board of a pregnancy support center is that there's a lot of people that want to use language that's non-confrontational. And the reality is if you saw somebody actually picking up a knife and going to stab it in somebody's heart, you wouldn't just go, well, I understand how annoying he is, but, you know, you still shouldn't murder him. No, you go, stop it. Right. And we want to think that we can just use kind language with somebody who wants to use, I mean, to commit the act of murder. That's not how you treat murderers. You have to say, stop it. You can't murder it, them. You have to, you know, get in their face. You have to be offensive. And we, the, the pro-life movement has come to this idea that all we should be is just, oh, the, the poor woman, she's in this situation Instead of going, you know what, you're in a bad situation. Murdering your child is not going to make your situation better. I can guarantee you that. Right. It won't make your situation better. You think murder is the solution to your problem? It doesn't work for anybody, and it's not going to work for you. Right. But too often it's like, oh, we know that you have a difficult situation. We'll try to, instead of just saying, don't murder. 
Yeah, I mean, maybe, uh, I mean, I think the language should still be kind and, uh, you know, polite, but still honest and very clear and what people would call confrontational. Yeah, and I don't think you can overstate how important the the preaching of truth on this is in in the in the sense of Paul talking about just the foolishness of preaching. I mean, I try and build what I'm saying there, but I mean, it, maybe like the first three decades of abortion legalization, seventy to two thousand, the argument was really is the baby a person, and that was that was where public discourse was. And the pro-life movement pointed out that there were all of these euphemisms that we used to cloud the act of abortion, and and they're all right. And I mean, it was it was a decent argument for for what it was worth. To, but but there was a time when we thought that all you had to do to win the day with abortion was convince people that actually it's a baby, and once you do that, everybody's going to realize, oh yeah, okay, we shouldn't kill babies. But we've moved past because. It's so obvious. It's so, it was always it, obvious. If it's too. not a baby, what is it? Right. You know, and there's and, been miscarriages. Everybody knew it wasn't a secret. Right. So, so I mean, so we've, you know, that debate has sort of moved past where we're not really talking about is it a baby anymore, and if it's a baby, you know, if it's a person, human person, then you can't kill human persons. That's murder. You know, we're past that. We're now to the point where you can buy an I Heart abortion T-shirt on Amazon. Or you can get a an I I loved my abortion coffee mug, you know, we're pretty bloodthirsty, and and we're to the point where we're basically willing to say, I know it's murder, and I'm okay with that, and shame on you if if you think that I shouldn't be okay with that. And yeah, you drew the parallel to the the concentration camps. I think the clearer parallel parallel even though that's a good one i'm not rejecting that one is the valley of hinnom where where the jews were going and sacrificing their children that's what we're doing and there were plenty of jews that were sitting in jerusalem that i said i'm sure said i would never do that but they didn't stop it and the reality is is it becomes acceptable and there were people who did it and they said we want to do it and we're going to go do it and we're going to sacrifice our children and god's going to be pleased with us and you go to the abortion clinics now, and there's plenty of women that walk in and say, I know this is God's will that I murder my child. Right. And the church isn't going, no, this is insane. And the church isn't speaking up and saying, you can't do this. And so it's not, it's not that they didn't know it was a baby in the Valley of Hinnom. It's not that they didn't know that it's a baby now. It's that people are bloodthirsty, and a lot of them call themselves by the name of Christ even if they just sit there and watch it happen because they go, maybe sometime I'll be tempted and I'll get a girl pregnant and I want her to be able to abort her baby. So even though I haven't done anything, they still approve of it. And God in Romans 1 says they're equally guilty. Right. So, so we had this kind of discussion back in our Ravi Zacharias discussions or those podcasts where, you know, it's the sins that he was committing when he was committing these various adulteries. It's not like you just fall into those and, oops, whoops, there I, I right. sinned. It's, it's you, you practice ha- that you it. have to practice a whole bunch of little sins before all of a sudden you're having abortion or paying for somebody to have an abortion or being a doctor performing abortions you're you're training yourself to sin along the way and so it may feel like you just i just did that i just fell into it but just, you yeah, trained it just yourself happened. i got pregnant i had no idea you know right it's like yeah you were doing a lot of things that caused you to get pregnant ahead of time it's usually not the first time Right. And or, or you know, I mean— Or even there's, working up to it. Yeah. Right. And, or, or, you know, I mean, the, there's a number of abortions that are committed by people who are happily and legally married. and But to Very come to percent. the point where you're deciding we're not going to raise a, another child or this particular child in our family, you've made a lot of intellectual compromises along the way. You've told yourself a bunch of lies. You've believed a bunch of lies to get to that point. And I want to make the argument that the primary lie that's believed is that God loves you and not that you should fear God. I think that's the basic lie that is the one that that cleanses. And if you just embrace the idea, oh, Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. If you embrace that instead of fear God 
is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you embrace the one, then in the end, there is no, no stopping all the other sins. And that's, I think, is the, in the end, that's the only solution to abortion, is that the church has to start preaching the fear of God. Right. The church has to actually fear God. Good point. Thank you. That, that <laughs> is a proper correction. The church has to start fearing God. Which is not, I mean, I want to, I'm not correcting you, but, I, you know, it sounded like you're saying we shouldn't tell people that God loves them, which. We shouldn't, we should tell people that God loves those who he loves. Exactly. Right. But, but what you don't want to be telling people is that you don't want to set up this paradigm that is God loves you and wants you to be happy. And that's the most important thing ever. Right. You can even frame it a slightly different way. No one can have a proper understanding of God's love if they don't start with his fear, fearing God. You yes. can't, because in the end, like it's saying, it's the beginning of wisdom, it's the beginning of knowledge. You cannot have knowledge of God's love without fearing God first. If you come to God's love without starting with fear, you don't actually know God's love. And that, I mean, and so, and I think there is just this, it is absolutely impossible for anyone to know or understand the love of God without fearing him. God loves his children. God gives good things to his children, but he does not give good things to his children so that they can disobey him. Right. And, you know, the, the modern church kind of says, you know, God has a wonderful plan for your life. And this is widely spread out there. It's talked about, you know, hopefully not that much in Reformed churches, but it's widely out there in the evangelical community. And if your thought is, God has a wonderful plan for my life, and I just got pregnant, and this baby's going to ruin that wonderful plan, obviously God has a wonderful plan for my life. I should abort the baby. And we should recognize that these two are very much in con contrast with one another and contradict one another. The question is, do we fear God? And then trust that if we fear him, he will bless us, and there's other things. But it starts with fear. Or, or you know, You've misinterpreted the circumstances. God does love you. God does have a wonderful plan for his life, and his wonderful plan for your life was to expose the sin that you had. Right. And this is how it happened, and and give you an opportunity to repent and start fearing him, which you have not been doing. Right. Or out of the horror that some relative, some relative intended something for evil, and God intended something for you for good. You know what I mean? I mean, because this is the idea of when you tell someone because someone did something horrible to you that there, no good can come of it, that's just not scriptural either. You know what I mean? Is there's right. just this, at, you, know, at, you know, we need to move to the point where at best you have a discussion over whether you should put the child up for adoption or not. That's, you know what I mean? Is that needs to become the only discussion that actually is had, not whether I'm going to keep the baby. And part of that is properly understanding the fear of God. If you read 2 Kings 24, verses 1 through 4, In his days Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him, and the Lord sent against him, raiding bands of Chaldeans, bands of Syrians, bands of Moabites, and bands of the people of Ammon. He sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servants, the prophets. Surely at the commandment of the Lord this came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done, and also because of the innocent blood that he had shed. For he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Israel was to, or Judah was destroyed by Babylon and sent into captivity for 70 years because they thought it was okay to shed innocent blood. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we should expect the wrath of God on our nation for the millions of people that we have murdered as a nation. And the church needs to be saying that, that we should expect his wrath upon us. We did the podcast on confusion. That's part of the judgment of God. But God wipes out nations for this. And how often does the church say this to politicians? You want to be a, a senator of this state but yet you want to destroy the state because you think it's okay to murder somebody just because their father was a rapist. The church needs to start saying that. And when you look at it, uh, 
passage like this one from Second Kings, I mean, that the circumstances they're talking about there are where people were taking their children and sacrificing them to idols. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no question it's a baby. There's no question it's my baby. There's a family resemblance there. And by killing babies in the womb, what we've been trying to do is hide ourselves from that fact. And the more that we can't hide ourselves from that fact, the more we become like this, where where we're stuck with these are people, we're killing people, and either we're going to repent from that or we're going to harden ourselves. We're going to sear our souls to it, and God will destroy us. And you were talking about the searing of the sword, the soul, you know, I love my abortion, right? I mean, that's the searing that you're talking about. We're seeing that in our nation. And the church better get active about saying something different. God will end abortion. Right. The question is, will he end abortion with the United States still existing, or will he end abortion? Because he will end abortion. You know, and going back to the, the beginning where we talk about the trying to repeal the Hyde Amendment and the Helms Amendment, I mean, in a sense, the church is not losing a lot of ground there because it's not really it's not really ground that was being held much but there's also a sense in which what we're saying as a nation is now hey this is one of those things that we're going to export and we're going to fund and we're just, especially we're going to do it in the poor countries of the world because you know this is not something that rich countries don't already have and they're not the ones that are getting the bulk of the aid that, that are just being talked about here Right. I was in Malawi about five years ago. And in Malawi at the time, they were very anti-homosexual and anti-abortion. And all of a sudden, Europe comes in and says, these laws have to change or you'll lose the 50 percent of the funding that comes to your government from Europe. And so don't kid. And they, they change their laws. Don't kid yourself. This is how nations adopt abortion. That's what they're doing it for like eliminating the Helms Helms Amendment, will cause nations to start killing their children. And so in one sense, it's not a big deal. In another sense, it's a huge deal. The United States has almost more influence in certain ways outside of the country than it does inside the country because those politicians can wag things all over the world and can drive things all over the world. And this was a tool that was specifically excluded that now they're working hard to get it included as a tool that Biden can use to cause babies to be murdered in Africa. Not the rich countries. You can't bribe them. You can't hold them hostage to it. It's only the poor countries that you do this to. And, and I mean, the, the rhetoric from the Democrats on this is very clear that this amendment has been something that has been, quote, unquote, harming black and brown people. And that by repealing it, we're going to be offering black and brown people some, you know, wonderful aid and comfort, which is just, I mean, it it's clouding everything under, it's, it's looking at everything completely backwards, completely upside down. We're totally confused. We're going to, to tell people, black and brown people, that, hey, you know, we're going to pay for you to kill your own children. Right. And think that that is somehow not racist. And and to say otherwise is to be racist. It, this It's just absolutely, completely upside down. But, you know, the fact that this is this is what uh, this is what where the debate is, is because the church is, has failed. Uh, the fact that Donald Trump is called the most pro-life president ever because he spoke at the March for Life when he was just less of a pro-death president because he still supported those exceptions and he still appointed judge to the Supreme Court who could not say something so simple as uh, that the Fourth Amendment doesn't guarantee abortion. It's about illegal searches and seizures. So, such a basic to do with reading of you know, words, they, they won't say that. And you know, he's appointed these judges that are not going to overturn Roe versus Wade uh, unless there's a miracle in my opinion. Um, be, and, and that's tolerated. And, and so we have this debate over this uh, very, you know, edge cases. Not only should it be legal here, but should we be using government money to export to other countries? I mean, it's the fact that that's where the debate is, 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 is a very sad thing. And, you know, the church isn't going, are you insane? Because the church, if it, those who profess to be Christians, 
there's a reason why it's been in there since, you know, one was in since 73 and one was in since 76. The reason is they just assumed that the church would flip out if they said, we're going to start to murder people in Africa. We're going to start murdering people in poor countries throughout the world. They just assumed the church would go, absolutely not. And guess what? What is the church doing about what it did with homosexuality? We've said bad things about the church, you know, broadly speaking. But, I mean, I don't, I don't think that there's that many um, orthodox churches, small o, um, that there's any question as to their position on abortion. And there are many, many, many churches that are very active on abortion. There are many, there are Christians who go too far and make pro-life the only thing that they're judging candidates on. Um, so, I mean, and I'm, there are, you know, they pass this thing, there's going to be all kinds of people speaking up, but there are some fundamental compromises that churches are making. Um, there's other sins that they're allowing. There's the way they're approaching it is really, um, taking away from the power of the message that the message ought to have standing on God's word and instead making it, making it a political fight. I mean, and like I said, it's, it's easy. We make lots of, I'll see comments. People go, you know, what do you guys mean when you say the church, you know, the church has failed in this. And I mean, I should just be, I can be specific about, I can see in myself a lack of care you know, at our church, we have people who every week go out and protest at the abortion clinic. I've been out there once or twice. And, you know, I am doing some other things, but I'm not, I could make more time. And I haven't. And so there is this part of it where, I mean, it's like, it's like you were saying, there is a difference between going, my position is this, and going, they're murdering babies. You know what I mean? And that's, there's even that's a difference between different, that right? and a fearful expectation of God's judgment. Right. If we were looking at it and saying, we know what God does. We know what he said he'd do. We know what he will do. Right. And if we had a fearful expectation of judgment, our attitude would be different. Right. And so, that, so I think there is just a point where, you know, it's, it's very easy to go, my position is absolutely solid. And also at the same time, you can be guilty of not having sufficient care. Right. Right. To hold to truth is different than fighting for truth. Right. And there are limits to how far you should go to fight for something that you care about. I mean, God does not say, stop abortionist, whatever it takes. God doesn't say you're allowed to go and kill abortionists. You're not allowed to go blow up clinics. You're not allowed to, to, to call in fake bomb threats. To, you know what I mean? You're not allowed to do any of those things. I mean, there are limits that God has put on the authority that we have and what we can do. And we have to work through established jurisdictions, the authorities that are in place, as much as we might be frustrated by them, as much as we might look at look at them and say, why won't you do these things? They were appointed by God. And we actually have an obligation to work through them and to believe that the power of his word is what will change the world and not just that we can do whatever we want, and that it's my fist and my might and my power that will cause this to happen. And I think that's hurt the pro-life movement in many ways is where people go, well, they're a murderer, so therefore I can become a murderer. Right. Well, that, again, it's, it's undermining your own argument. It becomes very illogical if you're saying that the reason they can't do it is because they're murdering, then to turn around and they go, but, you know, some of them would argue, well, the state should put them to death and doesn't put them to death, so therefore we're going to do it. Well, guess what? God says that the sword was given to the state. It's not right. given to the individual. It's not and given to the church. It's not given to the church. I mean, the, a more powerful sword is given to the church, right. which is what the real problem is, is that we're not wielding the more powerful sword that we have. Which is the sword of his word. Yes. Right. And I think, you not, know, you know, an actual hidden sword somewhere. <laughs> 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 and I think... Uh, a uh, well-developed understanding of jurisdictions is pretty important here. Understanding that we personally are not given the sword. We can't go execute people. Um, but understanding how the Bible teaches for uh, people, for magistrates to respond when there is injustice, grave injustice, tyranny um, in the country, that it is the job of the lesser magistrates to stand up against the greater magistrates. Um, and this is something that is that far out exceeds the time that we have remaining and might be good to talk about another time. But, you know, a, a big obstacle that people see it in the way is the Supreme Court and Roe versus Wade. When that when the decision that decision is is just coming from the judge's own opinions and not coming from the Constitution and not 
based in law. And the way our system is set up is that the Supreme Court doesn't make the laws. Uh, the Congress is supposed to make the laws. And each federal officer and each uh, state government is supposed to be enforcing the Constitution, and they take an oath to the Constitution. And, I, um, and most states even take state officers, I believe, take an oath for the federal Constitution as well. And so to submit to those federal uh, court orders and to say, we just have to, you know, what can we do? When, when they have a jurisdiction given by God that would allow them to, re to resist that because they are in a position as a magistrate and they have legal justification to do so. The fact that that isn't happening is a major uh, jurisdictional misunderstanding. And, the, and we can also at the same time, we can also, you know, there is blame to go around because the reality is some of these men that would be willing to do that, they don't think anybody would stand behind them and they they right, would fall. Right. It's yeah, and I we've mean, seen it happen in the past. People right. need to be calling for it. It needs to be the it needs to be the dual thing is that people need to be saying this needs to happen, and then representatives need to stay. I'll I'll risk things to make it happen, and to actually be leaders rather than followers. So many of them tend to be followers, including the Supreme Court. I mean, it's very easy for you know the Supreme Court isn't going to rule against Roe versus Wade unless the public opinion changes the the Supreme Court almost always just reflects what they see as the the direction of public opinion including Roe versus Wade and if this sounds uh, radical or sounds revolutionary it actually isn't this is going on right now you know federal law prohibits marijuana how many states have legalized marijuana? That is in contradiction to not just a Supreme Court decision, but in, in uh, opposition to federal laws. The states have nullified the federal drug laws. Um, with guns, you know, I don't know how much of that has actually happened, but it has definitely been threatened. And I guarantee that if, certain, if the federal Congress passed certain laws in the near future, that states would immediately nullify those laws. Um, why hasn't that happened with abortion? And it's on both sides, right? I think I was reading something this week that like two-thirds of the counties in the United States have said that we won't obey gun laws if there's any gun confiscation laws, that they go, we're a Second Amendment sanctuary state, which basically means we don't care what people, other people interpret the Second Amendment, just like they interpreted the Fourth Amendment to say that somehow the, pro the right to privacy means you're allowed to murder your baby. I mean, that's an insane twisting but they're passing all these things, and so it's both the right and the left are both going, we're not going to put up with it. So we know that both sides can do it, and they'll do it for their guns, but they won't do it for their children. Right. How many, how many of those counties are, will uh, support you if you have an un light, uh, unregistered suppressor or short-barreled rifle? It's kind of interesting to see if the, how many of those would actually stand behind it, because there are a lot of unconstitutional federal gun laws that they allow federal agents to still enforce. So that's kind of an open question. <laughs> In a different topic. That, we that's a subject for another day. <laughs> we sh and we should do a topic. We should do that at some point because I think it's, it's incredible. I mean, it's not only – your point was you said it's not revolutionary. I mean, the system was even designed to allow – I mean, from the very beginning to allow this sort of thing to happen. And the fact that we find it odd is just because we don't, we don't understand the topic that well. And we – we all have an expectation that it could happen. We all have an expectation. Nobody's sitting here going with the marijuana stuff. Well, that'll never happen. We all have seen it. Right. We all saw it with sodomite marriage. The same thing, right? Certain states started to say it, and then they said, you have to honor our, 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 you know, our marriage licenses. You have to honor that. Even though it's two men, you have to honor it in other states. Right. And they tr pushed it. And it's not that hard, even though the federal law said the opposite. We all know how this can work. We've seen it in our lifetimes. But yet, the people of God don't care enough about the babies in this country. They don't care enough about the innocent blood being shed to actually force the issue. They don't fear God. I mean, we they don't, don't fear we God. We don't fear God. That's, I mean. We don't have a fearful expectation of judgment. And there's a, I mean, there's an even harsher way of saying it. In, in Proverbs, wisdom says that all who hate me love death. And we're getting to the point where it's harder and harder for us to say that we don't love death. And, and this is the one, you know, think of all the other things where, we're, where conservatives might actually be winning some arguments here or there. And we haven't come, there, we haven't won anything 
with abortion since 1973, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And this has been the sort of thing that's been told to us. So you have to vote for such and such candidate because they're the one that, I mean, and and it's never worked out. We've never had a candidate who actually got elected as president and then got the right Supreme Court justices in who were, we could have done this so many times, so many ways, but we haven't. And you have to say, well, why haven't we? And Proverbs tells us it might be because you love death. This is a weird switch from that, but it's Lucy and Charlie Brown. The football. We love the idea of, oh, this one, you just hold the football, and this time the Republicans will actually ban abortion. And we keep running up to the same people who keep pulling the football out. Go watch people the who understand of the conservatism needs to die because that's mm-hmm. we talk about that at length. Right. The goal is to keep a people that are that are eager to work for them, not a people that want solutions. Right. And so there's way too many people that go out there and work for pro life causes where the same person, they're electing him senator every six years, and every six years they say, I'm going to repeal Roe versus Wade. I won't vote for any, any justice that wouldn't repeal Roe versus Wade. And then they go around and they vote for him because they won't even ask the question. Right. Or they don't demand an answer to the question. And then they come back six years later and they go, I won't vote for any justice that won't go against Roe versus Wade. And the same people go out there and knock on doors. They make the phone calls. They do all the work. And we not need to stop being Charlie Brown. I mean, one of the things that that for the church to have credibility is we need to be doing those things that, you know, what God says is pure and undefiled religion before God and man, right, before man as well, is helping widows and orphans in their distress. And when the church seems to be very self-centered, very seeker-sensitive, very inward-looking about how they can satisfy themselves— we shouldn't be surprised that our testimony to the world's bad in this area because why would people listen to people who are self-centered? And the church needs to be about the business of caring for the, the widows and the orphans and obviously the fatherless. I mean, in the womb, when the mother's killing them, when the father wants the baby to die, who's more of an orphan than that? But the living ones we have to be careful to take care of as well if we want to have credibility if we want to actually say we care about life. We actually have to care about life. And it's not just the the woman that's going to the abortion clinic. Right. I mean, frequently, I mean, one of the reasons, it's kind of like reading Proverbs. There are times where you read Proverbs and you, you go, how do I apply this? And you strain so hard at it to apply it when it's really actually simple. And there's this part of it where, I mean, widows and orphans are the most, are frequently the most oppressed. I mean, they're, they're, they're so easily oppressed. They don't have someone to protect them. They're, you know, they're someone who was designed to have a head over them to protect them. And God says he'll be that for them. But the way that he usually is that, the way that f- frequently is that, is through the church. And so there's this part of it where, I mean, we've just, we've just lost the idea of what oppression actually is. And even with abortion, I mean, there are times where the widow's getting an abortion because she's being oppressed, because she's being told that's your way out. Because right, this is your only escape. And so, I mean, there is this, they all tie together. I mean, you know, the, the ch- there is a form of it where taking a child who has been molested and is pregnant to get an abortion is another form of in- incest, is abusing authority sexually over someone. Taking them to come into the abortion is just a continuation just of Just abusing that. violence over them in another right. way. It's, yeah. it's just, I mean, and so there is this part of it where, I mean, we don't, we've just, you know, we just, we've just continued it. We haven't even ended it. And we've argued that this is the end of their oppression. No, it's just a continuation of it. And so, I mean, we've just, we've lost the plot completely. And we don't want to look at our government, which instead of being the one that should be constraining evil, it should be wielding the sword to be the avenger of God's wrath. We don't want to look at them and say, the reality is they're the oppressor. Right. Even though they are not picking up that scalpel, scalpel to kill that baby, they are the oppressor. They are involved in the oppression. And, and the, the church, church the has oppressor. to rebuke the oppressor. The right. church has that duty. Right. And when we don't, we should expect the wrath of God. 
Manessa was the one that was shedding innocent blood largely. He was leading it is what it says in that passage. But yet in the end, they all suffered. They all felt the wrath of God because they had a duty to stop it and they didn't. The church has a duty to stop it. We have to care for the widow. We have to care for the orphan. And the, the church has accepted the bribe of entertainment and pleasure and satisfaction of the things of the world. And your best life now. Inst- I mean, you know what I mean? It's, I mean, this is that thing. I mean, I work for you. And if at my job someone paid me to put their best interests first, you'd fire me. And you should. And the church, the church has been bribed by the world to put the world's interests first as opposed to God's. The church has been bribed, and we've loved the world, and that's what it is. And so we've been bribed by the oppressors. We've, so we're, I'm complicit. You know what I mean? And there's no way around that. I mean, like you were saying earlier, Dan, the closest parallel in this is in, in the Bible is when you look at cases of child sacrifice. And, and that's dovetailing with what you're saying yeah. is, is we don't call it that, but abortion is this great sacrament to the various idols yes. that we have mm-hmm. of the age. And that because we worship other things, that we worship entertainment, career, kinds of freedom, because we worship sexual license, because we, we have all of these things that are the untouchable idols. Who pay, who has to pay for that? Because somebody's got to pay when you, when you have idols. Something's got to be sacrificed, and we've, we've picked our babies. Yeah. Oh, and widows and orphans, and I mean... The and whole the elderly, right? I mean, we kill right. the elderly for the same way, because... We're more concerned. I mean, covetousness is idolatry. We're a nation that's filled with covetousness, mm-hmm. and there's a real price to pay. If I had another child, my children won't have all the things I want them to have, so I'll kill my own baby that was with my husband. We've agreed together to sacrifice our child so that our other children will have a better life. That's exactly what everybody that's done child sacrifice has always said that they're doing it for these reasons. And we want to make ourselves and pretend like we're a civilized country. We're a Christian nation. We have the word of God and we turn around and we're really no different than the, all the generations, all the thousands of years that there's been pagan societies that have sacrificed their children. We're no different, but we do have the word of God. We do have the spirit of God in those who believe And so we do have the power to overcome this, which those nations didn't have the same thing in a lot of cases. But we do. And the church should recognize its culpability in the matter. Thank you for joining us for the the Conquering Truth. It's an important subject, especially when we think about Isaiah 1, where it says why God destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, why he destroyed the southern kingdom. One of the things that it says is that they didn't rebuke the oppressor and they didn't defend the fatherless. Will we be any different? Thanks for joining us. This has been The Conquering Truth, a project of Reformation Baptist Church. If you found this helpful, you can visit us online at theconqueringtruth.com and subscribe here or in your favorite podcast app. Thanks for watching.